the silly, crazy, outrageous show. I think it's chewing gum. Hey. I think the world will be fine with it. The world will be fine without it. Hey. Without it, it's just a stupid show at times. Absolutely and, not. And that's all it is. No, it is not. Rick, your most used to stop at it. Do you remember Mike White saying this? There are black and brown and yellow and white bigots in America. And I would assume that there are black and brown and red and yellow and white bigots in the employ of the city of Cleveland. Yeah, well, that was an issue that we talked about for a little bit, and then we tended to get away from it with all this going cuckoo for the Ku Klux Klan crap going on. You know all about that. I talked about it yesterday forever. Broadcasting live from downtown Cleveland, phone number here, 578-1100 in the 216 area code, toll free, 888-723-WTAM. If it gets busy, we'll open up 578-1111, also in the 216 area code. Well, Boss White badmouths the police, and this is a topic that we really have not discussed at length, and I think we probably should, because this does nothing but ruin the morale of the police, does nothing to help the safety of our citizenry as we travel about, because the police, if they go out on a blue flu, something like that happens. For God's sake, let's hope we don't have a blue flu August 21st, huh? And we'll find out whether or not we're going to have the damn Klan rally or not. But I was just thinking, you know, of all the experience that I've had with the police, I've had an awful lot of times where I got off lightly. And I thought, gee, maybe we should discuss this a little bit. Maybe we should discuss some of the good things the police do, instead of always the bad things that they do. And I considered a time that I was driving home from downtown Cleveland that was on my birthday. And I don't know if this is going to sound like a bad story or not, but oh, some drinking had been done. And I had a bag of empties from where I was leaving. And I came around the metro curve doing about 85 miles an hour and saw a brown Chevy sitting on the side of the road. And I knew right away I was busted. And I hit the brakes. And there was a lot of traffic. And how he knew it was me, I don't know. But he knew before I even got around the curve and pulled out and got up behind me. Now, I didn't have time to do anything, and all the thoughts that flashed through my mind were, oh boy, here comes the breathalyzer test, and I've got a story that ties into that as well. A lawmaker is trying to change a state law that he says encourages people to refuse to take breathalyzer tests when they're suspected of driving drunk. Senator Scott Olslager said the bill was introduced last month that would make those who refuse the test prove they were not drunk at the time. Now, I don't know how the hell you'd do that. A Republican from Canton says his bill not only shifts the burden of proof from the state to the suspect, it would double the license reinstatement fees for those who refuse. ACLU director uh, Chris Link said the bill violates constitutional rights by assuming those who refuse are guilty. Link says it's reasonable that some people might not want to take the test because, mm, where am I? I'm looking over there and my tape's not running, Daniel. I don't know what happened to it. Maybe you can see if you can get that thing to work. It's reasonable that some people might not want to take the test because there's enough research done to show that the machines do fail. If that tape's no good, look in this bag. I got another one. We have these four-cent tapes around here, and they sometimes just jam up and don't work. Nearly a third of motorists asked to take the alcohol test in Ohio last year refused to do so. Well, I'll tell you the truth. I have never been pulled over, knock on wood for DUI. But when I got pulled over that morning, and it was pretty early in the morning, I thought, oh, boy, here we go. There were empty beer cans on the floor where the bag had spilled and fallen over. The cop walked up to me. And I had one of those CPPA cards and my license. And he said, who gave you that card? And I said, it's the vice president of the CPPA. He goes, what's his name? I said, uh, 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 uh. And I look, and he's, he's no longer standing next to the window. Now he's in his car writing me a ticket. And he walks up, and he says, well, I see this card's also signed by another officer. I said, yeah, it was an officer out at the airport. And he says, well, I wrote your ticket for 19 miles an hour over the speed limit instead of over 20, because he realized if you go over 20 miles an hour over the speed limit, you have to make an appearance in court. He says, if you would have remembered the name of the officer that gave you the CPPA card, the name of the guy, the vice president, if, if you would have remembered that, well, uh, he says, I wouldn't have given you a ticket at all. And if the guy at the airport gave, that gave you the ticket wants to show up downtown, I'll void your ticket. And this also happened to be on my birthday. And he said, happy birthday. Now sign the ticket. So I did. And I never sent anybody from the airport over there to try and do anything about it or not. But there were just numerous instances of this. I used to drive around like a wild man. I used to drive around like a wacko when I lived in Fairview Park. I was a lot younger then. Finally, I got to the point where I had 12 points on my license. I believe I might have had 10 points on my license, but I got two tickets. That's what it was. I had 10 points on my license because if you take the state remedial driving course, 
it takes two points off of your license. So I took the state remedial driving course, got the two points taken off in the assumption that when I had eight points, if I could get out of one of the tickets and or whatever it was, I wouldn't have 12 points, I would not lose my license. But it didn't look good because my record was so terrible. I had so many things on it. And I talked to a cop in Fairview. And I said to him, I'm going to change my ways. I'm not going to drive around like that anymore. I'm not, I'm not going to be a wacko like that anymore. I said, I mean it, too. And he said, well, I'll see what I can do. Well, I went to court. I must have had 15 entries on my license. And it was the blind judge, Judge Holmes, and he had his bailiff read things to him. So he's reading off what I did, and it was like two offenses from five years before. And the judge goes, that's all? That's all? Why do we have the officer in here? Why did he... Well, it was the officer that was in the court was the same one that I told him I was going to change my ways. And they gave me a little slap on the hand, and they let me go. And as we were walking out, that cop said to me, you owe me one. Well, I don't believe I ever repaid the favor. I don't believe he ever asked for one. But I kept thinking there must be numerous instances that the police have done something good. Because it happens all the time, but you don't hear about that. So I thought it might be interesting for a while to open up the forum here and see what you had to say, see what you think. Tell me an instance of the cops doing something nice for you, something good for you, instead of something terrible. Sav and Cleveland, you're on the air. Hello? Are we having phone difficulties? I'll put Sav on hold. Hi, Bill, you're on the air. Yes, we are. Hey, tell him the Sandman, Sal. Hello? Let's try Sal again. Hello, Sal. Hey, tell him the Sandman. All right, that was interesting, wasn't it? Okay, so any, in any event, I've got some other stories to go to, but if you have any instances, really, there have to be numerous instances of the police doing something good for you instead of something awful. Chew on that for a while. Ring me up. News Radio, News Radio WTAM 1100. Hey, see? What's the word? Thunderbird. Now, back to Rick Gilmore on WTAM 1100. It was wrong of me to assume that Gilly has no talent. Yes, it was. I'm Rick Gilmore. Media darling. Doctor of broadcasting. Channel 3 weather from Brian Allen. Tonight, cooler with a low of 56. Currently 68 degrees in Cleveland, 68 degrees. Talking about the cops. I happen to think that the Cleveland police are treated so poorly, they're underpaid. We all know that. But you must have some good police stories. There was an article in the paper talking about... Atlanta mass murderer Mark Barton was a suspect in another earlier crime, the killing of his first wife and mother-in-law six years ago. Carrie Stainer arrested for beheading a young woman in Yosemite National Park, then confessed to a triple murder, a crime for which he had been interviewed months earlier by the FBI. So-called railroad killer Resendez, I'm not going to read his whole name because it's too difficult, surrendered last month, but only after he'd slipped through the fingers of law enforcement officers several times. The litany of killers eluding justice until they repeat their carnage has raised questions about whether law enforcement officers are aggressive enough in finding, holding, and charging offenders. Well, I'd certainly think they have a workload ahead of them, don't they? And I look at Cleveland and I think, I'd like to hear from a Cleveland police officer, you can remain anonymous, but I'd like to know when is the blue flu going to happen? Because I'm certain it's just a matter of time. There's no doubt in my mind, with the Ashadi equipment, the conditions they have to work under, the only thing the Cleveland police have on their side is the fact that if they work downtown, you might get a new car. Because those are the ones that everybody sees. It's not what it's like out in the district. I talked to a gentleman and he told me, I've heard people say, oh, the police response time is just awful. Talked to a guy who told me that his house he thought was broken into. He called the Cleveland cops. He said, I think there might be someone in my house. I'm calling you from a neighbor's house. He said, w within 30 seconds, the cops were there. All you ever hear most of the time Oh, this stinking cop pulled me over and gave me a ticket. Oh, it's just awful. I happen to think that they're underpaid. I happen to think that they're probably stressed out most of the time. You tell me. I'd like to hear from a Cleveland cop. I'd like to hear from a suburban cop. You tell me what you have to put up with on a daily basis. And if you want to, tell me what kind of money you make. Because I bet you ain't making 40 grand a year to do it. David and Georgia, you're on the air. Yeah, Hello. Hello. Yes, I'm calling from Augusta, Georgia. Oh, well, welcome. How are we coming in down there? Uh, every chance I get. I lived in Cleveland for 40 years before I moved down here. Really? Yes. Well, what's on I'm your a mind? I'm time Browns fan. Well, you fan. get your chance to be a Browns fan again, won't you? Thank you very much. I can't wait. Well, all right. I'm getting a satellite dish so I can get the Browns. There you go. The NFL package. Okay. My question is, I don't quite understand. I heard you a couple weeks ago talking about it. 
What's with the uh, Ku Klux Klan rally? What is this all about up there? Oh, you hadn't heard about this? No. The Ku Klux Klan want to come into town and have a rally on the first Browns game that we play in the new stadium. That's August, Why? It's August 21st, because they claim that they want to protest the fact that tax dollars were used to build that facility. Now, that's not really the case, I think. I think they're fibbing, because it also happens to be the same day of the Black Family Exposition in downtown. Now, you lived in Cleveland. You probably lived here during the riots. Yes. Do you, yes. Think, do you think that we have enough police protection in Cleveland? Now, you didn't hear, if you didn't hear the whole story, then the mayor came out and said that he had a little bird tell him that there's racism rampant in the police department and that we need to do something about it. And he went to the newspaper about this before he went to his chief of police. He went right over Marty Flask's head. And then the newspaper writes an article about it, and then it turns out that these cops are playing Dungeons and Dragons, and that's about it. There's really nothing going on. So there aren't any racist statements. And, of course, you know when you get enough people together, there's bound to be a racist somewhere or another hiding. So then they find out that there's really no grounds for this. Then the mayor holds another press conference and blames the plain, plain dealer. So now all these things are happening. The police department morale is low. And now do you think that we have enough police to take care of a Klan rally? Oh, and then on top of everything else... He says it's okay for the Klan to change into their robes in the police department parking garage in the Justice Center. <laughs> so, so, now, can you imagine being a Cleveland cop and having to deal with all this and the shoddy equipment that they have? So there's rumor of a blue flu, and I'm thinking it's only a matter of time before the cops get fed up and walk out because the mayor's just treating them awful. So, now, the questions are many. Should we have the Klan rally? Couldn't we pull the permit and let them come back on another day? Should the, the, the mayor, Boss White... Should he, should he let the cops change into their robes in the police department parking garage? And he goes around prodding the police department like poking a hornet's nest. Oh, brother. So, so that's what's going on. Now, any further questions? Uh, sounds like uh, something I never left. <laughs> I've only been down here four years. Oh, yeah? You know, I, me, I miss Cleveland. I know a guy who moved from Cleveland to Atlanta, and, and he said he wanted to get out, out of the snow belt, away from the snow. He didn't like the cold weather up here. So he moves down there. He's down there. He gets married. He has a couple of kids. And he says, I'm moving back because I don't want my kids to talk with a southern accent. <laughs> I said, OK. So he moves back and he moves to Pierpont, Ohio, which is by Ashtabula. I thought he lived in, on, on the west side of Cleveland. Now he moved back to Ohio in the snow belt. And it was the year we got clobbered a couple of years ago. And I thought, well, that's not a good move. But he, he told me he couldn't stand it down there. Well, if I had my brother, I'd rather move back up there. Well, how did... I follow my wife down here. She's a professional. Oh, I see. So it was your job that took you there. <laughs> no, it was her job. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, I mean, you, you know, know, it was work. It was work related that why you went down there. Yes. All right. Well, uh, say hi to everybody in Augusta, and, and I'm... I'm rooting for the Browns. There you go. Rooting for the Indians, and I hope the Indians can beat Atlanta in the World Series this time. Well, we'll just be uh, happy if we get to the World Series. Oh, we'll get there. All right, thanks, David. Okay. All right, bye-bye. Bye. Let's go to Mike in his car. You're next. Hey, Gilly, it's your favorite repo man. Oh, how, how you doing? Uh, how's it going? All right. Listen, I got a, I had a couple quick stories to tell you. Sure. Uh, once in another life, about oh, it had to be about 25 years ago, I was coming home from uh, my weekly bowling with the, with the, the boys out. Right. And we had played... Uh, uh, on the bowling machine, we had played for shots of 151 rum. The uh, the loser had to buy everybody around. So you know, after six or seven games, you were we were pretty zonked. Yeah. I was trying to make my way home, and a Parma cop pulled me over. Now I've heard bad things about Parma. I heard they used to pull people over and take the penny and stick it in the tire to see if you could see Lincoln's head. Yeah. If you didn't have enough tread on your tires, they'd write you up for a safety violation. Well, he pulled me over because I went through the uh, the flashing lights at the uh, railroad track there by 130th and, and Brook Park. Yeah. Uh, they were always on. There was never a train there, so I just drove through it. And he pulls me over. As he's walking up to the car, I had a little Fiat X19, if you remember what those cars were. Yeah, they were awful little cars, oh, too. It was terrible. You and, know, they say there are no repeat Fiat buyers. <laughs> yes. Once they bought one, they were, that was enough. That's right. Um, I, uh, I'm, so I'm trying to open the door, and I was, I was pretty well zonked, and the door handle broke off in my hand. And the door popped open, and I fell out of the car right in front of the cop. Oh, that's bad. That was bad. And so I'm, I'm on my hands and knees in the middle of Brook Park Road, and he, uh, he asked me if, if I thought I could make it the rest of the way home. I was only a couple of miles from home. And I said, well, I think so. And he said, okay, I'm going to follow you. And he followed me all the way home and, and, until I pulled into my driveway and did not give me a ticket or anything. Yeah, there used to be a time where they'd do that a lot if somebody was drunk. And, and I've heard bar owners complain that they think cops sometimes sit outside bars and just wait for somebody who might be drinking to uh, pull them over. And I don't think for the most part, I've talked to cops. I did a ride around in North Olmstead, and I'll just say the cop's name was Rich. 
And the entire night we rode around, it was a Saturday night, he did not go out of his way. And I asked him, and he said, no, cops do not go out of their way to hang out side bars just waiting to see if somebody's got a DUI. He says, yeah. if somebody's driving around like a drunken moron and you see them pull into a bar parking lot, he says, we may pay special attention to that car and come back later to see when they're leaving. Because if they act like they were a little reckless when they're pulling in, what are they going to be like when they're pulling out? Sure, but, sure. And then a couple of years ago, there was a, a kitten in the middle of the West 25th Street Bridge there by the Y. And traffic was running over it, and, uh, but it hadn't been squashed yet. And we stopped to uh, see if we could gather it up. I had my wife and kids with me. And a Cleveland cop came up with uh, one of those uh, sticks with a noose on it. Oh, yeah. And caught it on the other side of the fence for us. So, uh, I mean, he was nice enough to do that for us. So, yeah, uh, cops do a lot of good, but we just don't seem to hear about it often yeah. enough. We still have that cat. Oh, you, it's your cat now. <laughs> yeah, it's our cat now. <laughs> yeah. We took it. Do you like cats? Ah, they're all right. They're all right. They're, you know, uh, the, the wife and kids uh, enjoy them. And they're, they're pretty much maintenance-free. You keep food and litter in the box and... That's true. They just don't seem to care much about you unless they're hungry. No, you could be getting stabbed to death, and a cat would just look at you and walk away. Yep, absolutely. I'm, a, I'm, I'm more of a dog man myself. Yeah, me too. But dogs, then again, are high maintenance, because if you leave the house and you don't let them out, you come back and you got spots on your carpet. And... Exactly. Sometimes even if you do let them out. Well, that's true, too. Yeah. All right, well, hey, happy repoing out there. Uh, have a good time tonight. All right. Thanks. All right, bye-bye. Yeah, Fiat X19. I had a Fiat Strada. Every time it would rain, the dashboard had compartments on top of it. Every time it would rain, it would fill up with about two inches of water on the dashboard. I ended up selling that thing. I've told that story before. Total junk. What are we talking about cops? Got any positive cop stories? Something good that happened? All we ever hear is the negative stuff. How about something positive for a change? If you'd like to email me, it's gillyshow at aol.com. Now stay tuned for Cliff Bakley and coverage of just what in the world is happening. News Radio, WTAM 1100. Instead of all the negative ones that we normally hear, in a show of support for fellow officers, 20 men or policemen have asked Chief Richard Amiat that they be punished for participating in an arm burning ritual. Last week, 19 officers were accused of violating department rules by participating in or witnessing a ritual where two officers put a lit cigarette in between their arms until one officer flinched. A police union official said that. Uh, with the 20 additional officers requesting punishment, more than half of the department could now face disciplinary action. Well, that's not something that I think they should be punished for. I just kind of wonder why they did it. And they showed the one guy that's in the, in the head of the police union out there or whatever. He's the one cop that said that he thought that they were just going after him because he's involved with the police union. Well, and that's a distinct possibility. I'm sure those things happen. I have one line open at 578-1111 and the toll-free, not blinking, at 888-723-WTAM. Well, I saw the guy's arm, and he had these scars all over it, and I thought, geez, you know, you know it's just kind, of, uh, just kind of unusual, don't you think? Just kind of odd that somebody would want to go in for that kind of behavior. It wasn't necessarily the kind of thing that I thought they should be punished for. It's the kind of thing I'd kind of know well, why. Hi, John, you're on the air. Hey, Gilly. Yes. Hey, it's uh, the mobile DJ that calls you up once in a while. Oh, how you doing? Oh, fine. I'm, I had a gig on a Sunday night, and I'm driving home. And actually, during my waiting for you, I switched from my cell phone, and I got to a bar... Uh, right down from your bar, it begins with a T and ends with an E. <laughs> and so here I'm on the patio. Oh, okay. I know where you're at. Uh, on the bar phone. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah, well, I had to get rid of my cell phone. Now, how's the weather out there? The weather's beautiful. I'm out on the patio. There's nobody out here. And, uh, yeah, it looks like I'm it was good. to have a Guinness. Oh, really? Yeah, oh, sure. I've never had a black and tan. Well, I don't, you know. Just a Guinness. Or yeah. a harp. I, you know, mixing them. I don't know. Bank or steam I usually go for. But... I could talk about a million things uh, with you. You know, yeah, the cops are underpaid, and uh, you know, uh, and yeah, we don't have enough police force for this KKK thing. But the uh, the good cop story, and uh, interestingly enough, I didn't know you were from Fairview. I this is a Fairview story. I grew up in Fairview too. Oh, how old are you? I'm uh, class of '76. Well, I'm class of '79. Okay, and uh, maybe I know you. I grew up in West Valley. Okay, I know exactly what you're talking about. So we were a really delinquent group in West Valley, and you can imagine that neighborhood with you know, a group of uh, 8, 10, 15 delinquents walking around that area. Let me jump in real quick. You ever seen a movie called Over the Edge? Mm. It was Matt Dillon's first movie. Michael Kramer was in it. It was about a, a group of kids growing up in Arizona where there was nothing to do in a housing project because it was just built mostly for the parents to have a nice place to live, but the kids had nothing to do. I don't think I did see it. Well, it pretty much exemplified that era entirely, and I, I suggest it for anybody who's... Over the Edge. Okay, cool. Yeah, Check about it. our age. It came out in 79, I think, or 80, and uh, very good movie. So this was the, the summer of 76, I think I was 18, and uh, it was pretty much a blur that summer. But uh, uh, we were you know, along the valley there. We used to go down the valley and drink all the time. Right. 
And uh, so this one time we're in a kind of a ravine into the valley and we're drinking. And uh, so I guess some neighbors or somebody, you know, saw us going into the woods kind of thing and called the cops. And this Fairview cop, you know, we're drinking and the Fairview cop uh, kind of yells over to us. It's like dusk, you know, and he's like, hey. And we, so we, uh-oh, we're hiding all the beers and we go walking over there. And uh, he goes, uh, I just got a complaint uh, from one of these people. And uh, I didn't actually walk over to where you were, so I really don't know what you were doing there. So, um after after I leave and it gets dark, come back and get your whatever it is and uh, go have fun. Yeah, you know who no normally do that? Our park rangers. Well, actually, I have another story where the park rangers busted our ass. Yeah. <laughs> oh, can I say that? Yeah, yeah. well, you just did. <laughs> and uh, it was, uh, yeah, the park rangers and the Fairview cops, and we, uh, boy, it was a big mess. But we never got charged or anything, but uh, they came into the valley with spotlights and uh, and caught us. Uh, doing all sorts of extracurricular activities. Oh, I was so uh, wacky when I was a kid. I had a black and white cop car I bought from... Uh, well, now, where'd you grow up on the, in Fairview there? Uh, I mean, Neighborhood-wise, you know, east side, west side? Uh, ooh, let me think. I guess it'd be west side. West side? So yeah. What, Coffinberry? Uh, no, not quite in that area, but uh, I don't want to get too specific. But, yeah, it was, that's fine. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, it was, it was not the uh, snooty part of town. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not going to defend what I was born into, you know. Well, I mean, yeah, it's not not your fault. I mean, you know, that's one thing about the Kennedy thing that really uh, angered me was uh, that people would, you know, shoot off about how he was rich and spoiled, and you know, how you know, he was born into that, you know. Yeah, I had this cop car, this black and white. I used to drive around like a wacko, and uh, what was funny was I had my buddy's plates on it, which was a bad idea. But that turned out to be the next day was a bad idea. But I was driving all over the place, and we were shooting bottle rockets at people. And we stopped. The buddy of mine there was a gas station, a Gulf station at uh, Brook Park and Mastic. And sure, you, I know it. you could drive behind it, and in the summertime, they had the doors open in the back of the building to try and let some air through. Uh -huh. I'm shooting, we're shooting bottle rockets through the back door, out the bay doors, at my buddy pumping gas. <laughs> now, how dumb of an idea is that? So we drove around like a nut, and I got out of town. I, I, I thought, I can't hang around in Fairview. The next day, I pulled up to my buddy's house, and as I'm driving up the street, I look, and there's a Fairview cop driving along, and he's blocking the intersection, and I look behind me, and there's another one blocking the other intersection. So I figured, well, I pulled in his driveway, and as soon as I pulled out, a cop pulls me over, and he says, uh, this your car? I go, yeah, I should have said it was my buddy's car. Right. Cause the, the plates were pretty close to what the car was supposed to be, or whatever, an old Plymouth. Uh, and I said, no, it's, yeah, it's my car. And he goes, well, that's too bad, because the plates come back to somebody else, and we're towing it. I said, you're towing my car for that? And he said, where did you go last night? I said, what do you mean? He says, we looked for you forever, and we couldn't find you. He says, what, you just up and disappeared. I said, yeah, I know. I took a tip from one of your other officers that told me to drive like that in Cleveland, so I just got out of town, and, well... He didn't think it was very amusing, but that was the same cop that gave me the break. Well, maybe this was the same cop. Who knows? Uh, I don't know. In well, you're 79, so I'm sure uh, there's a, I'm sure there's names that we could drop, but we don't want to do that on the air. That uh, I'm sure there's a like Herbie, across. Like Herbie, we're, we're, step, we're certainly not seven steps removed from Kevin Bacon. No, but remember Herbie the Love Cop? Yeah. <laughs> a cop in Fairview named Herbie. And one time I saw him, and he was trying to get somebody and arrest him, and he took his handcuffs off his belt and threw them at him. Because he was a little large, and he couldn't exactly <laughs> run after the guy. And he whacked the guy in the back, and the guy stopped. So he had time to walk up to him. But well, anyway, appreciate the uh, m reminiscing. Well, it was a uh, pleasure, Gilly, and uh, keep up the good work. And happy drinking. Oh, well, thanks. I'm about to head for my Guinness now. All right. Bye. Bye-bye. Uh, Chuck, you're next. Hey, uh, Gilpie. Hey, hello. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, let's go to Frank in Cleveland. You're on the air. Hello, Frank. Are you there? Yeah, uh, Frank's gonna have to listen to his radio and wait. Hello, seven. hello? Uh, can you here. can you turn your radio d all the way off, Frank? Because yeah. you're listening to it in delay. Oh, but hey. Yes. Am I on? Yes, you're on the air, Frank. How are you? Oh, wow, Mr. Gilly. Yeah, how are you? Nice. Uh, hey, I like that uh, blonde hair you got there, buddy. Yeah, well, what are you gonna do? Um, you're not changing like the rest of this uh, neighborhood over here, are you? No, well, over in Tremont. Yeah. Changing what? You mean sexual orientation? <laughs> I don't know. I heard some of your some of your callers think you are though. Yeah, well, some of the callers are full of crap. Hey, but uh, I, 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 all my life have, you know, I basically supported the police. My dad taught me to um, respect the police. Now you're the guy in Tremont that they came over and cut down your whole yard. Yeah. I notice it's growing. Cut down my yard. It cut down trees and bulldozed my yard. Well, I notice it's starting to grow back up again. I wonder how long it'll be till they pay another visit. Um, they, 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 they've been paying me visits, uh, they always pay me visits. Yeah. yeah. I had, I had, um, what was it, I had four, four, uh, 
fire cruisers over here the other day, uh, two arson cops, uh, two detectives, and uh, two uh, plane or two uh, sergeants, uh, Mr. Simone and his uh, buddy over here. Are you, so are you going to tell me you've lost respect for the police because of what's happened lately? I haven't lost any respect for anybody. Oh, because I really don't think it was the police at heart that's coming after you. It's more like the building department, isn't it? Uh, it's a, it's a, I, I think it's a joint effort by some some faction of uh, the city. I well, don't know if it's, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't blame it on all on the police. I, I blame it on certain individuals who... Uh, you know what I think? I think they want your land. Oh, for sure. You want to buy it? Me? Yeah. Uh, are you selling? Yeah. I'd consider it. 25 bucks. You can have the whole thing. Really? Uh, yeah. I'll take it. <laughs> all right. And then they can come over and harass me. No, they won't. They wouldn't do that. Well, that would be interesting, wouldn't it? You could just transfer ownership, and you can still live there. there hey, there we go. No, well, I'll talk to you off the air about it sometime. That no, would be interesting. Okay. But anyways, uh, my house is. I've been. i The police have. Uh, I, I'm gonna. I'm gonna. You know, there's. There's. I've been let off uh, driving by police, no doubt. I've probably even drank with police and stuff like that. I think. Uh, you know, they're good people. But uh, when a police officer. Uh, tells me that you know uh it wasn't it wasn't his fault why he did something he, he's just doing his job and maybe his job what he's doing is wrong then then it kind of reminds me of uh maybe some of the things that happened in nazi germany <clears throat> you know people saying using an excuse uh, my superiors told me to do this well, I think in some regards that's the case. I mean, they're told what to do, and they go out and do it, and they feel that if there's a problem and they get sued or something, well, it won't be them that gets in trouble for following orders, it, well, right? It, it'd be somebody else. I think sometimes they should use better, better discretion because uh, if, uh, you know, if, if you're uh, a police, when a police officer crosses the b bounds of the law, that police officer is, is a criminal. You follow me? I follow I'll, you. Fra Frank, i got to move on, but I appreciate the call. Okay. All right? Uh, hey, I'll take you up on that property thing. <laughs> okay, buddy. All right, bye-bye. Well, that's absolutely the case. I mean, when you, when you hear about dirty cops, you, you have to figure that well, what's the percentage of cops that are good cops? And what's the percentage that are dirty? You get enough people together in one room, right, you're bound to have some problems sooner or later. So you, you weed that person out, and you move on. There were a couple of cops in Fairview that are no longer cops. And what did they do? Well, I'm not going to go into all the sordid details, but uh, they broke the law. And if you break the law, and if you're accused of following someone into their house and handcuffing them and then beating them or something like that, well, that's clearly not legal. And they were removed. And there were other things going on, but I don't want to go there. Hi, Mark. You're on the air. What's that? Hey, you're on the air, Mark. Okay. How are you? I'm fine. Uh, what's on your mind? Well, you wanted the suburban police. <laughs> Yeah. So I figured I'd help you out. Okay. Well, uh, what, what's your what's your day like? Um. Well, normally. Yeah. Uh, pretty mundane, for the most part. Pretty quiet out there in Westlake. Sure. You Lots know. of uh, traffic. Um, big on traffic enforcement. We do have a lot of problem with uh, juvenile crime. Um. A lot of domestic violence type situations, for the most part. Uh, pretty minor stuff. Uh, nothing you could compare to Cleveland, obviously. You know what was interesting, and I'll run this by you. I, I called uh, about a week ago. I, I called and talked to the dispatcher, and I said, you know, I'm having a problem. I said, you know, this isn't really a problem. It's just kind of weird. I said, there's some guy. He's been sitting on the picnic table in my backyard singing and playing guitar to nobody for over an hour. <laughs> I says, I don't know how he got there. He doesn't seem to be doing any harm. And she says, did you go out and approach him? I says, no, I'm not going to approach him. I don't know what, he, what he's doing or anything else. And she goes, well, we're a little busy right now. We'll get there as soon as we can. I said, okay. So I waited and waited and waited. Now, about 10 minutes later, Bay Village pulls up. I thought, well, that was kind of interesting, wasn't it? And two guys get out of the car and go up and talk to this guy and look at his license and get his information and tell him to move on on his way, and then they left. Right. And I thought, is that, is that normal operating procedure for another city to show up? Well, it depends. At, at, out in Westlake, we have what's called mutual aid agreements with all the surrounding uh, communities. And if something else is tying up all the units that we have out on the road, our dispatch will contact you know, one of the neighboring cities and ask for mutual aid. And, uh, yeah, they, they would respond to the location in the other city and, uh, you know, do whatever it needs, uh, needs to be done. It's amazing because I remember going out to Westlake when I was a kid. There was, it was just like farm country out there. Oh, it's, it's 
changed greatly in the in just the 10 years that I've been there. Every time I drive up and down one of these streets now, I see huge areas where there used to be trees and they got bulldozers in there cleaning them out, and I know what they're doing. They're going to build a housing development. Sure. We have, uh, you know, obviously a lot of uh, upper uh, income housing going up, and uh, it seems a lot of the uh, retirement-type villages uh, seem to be very popular out there, too. And uh, how many officers are on the department out there? I think right now we're up to um, total personnel, uh, including supervisors and the chief, uh, somewhere around uh, 46, 47, somewhere in there. I was going to say, you could probably use a few more. Well, if the population continues to grow the way it, it has been over the last uh, 10 years or so, and I think they projected it's going to be a city of about 40,000 by the time it's all done, um, yeah, you have to uh, you know keep expanding uh, to, I, to match that increase. I just thought it was interesting that I used to pump gas with your captain. Right. <laughs> and it was, it, it, he got the job uh, as an officer, and it seemed like no time. It seemed like five years he was captain. <laughs> he I mean, went up through the ranks uh, pretty quickly. Yeah, because the city, he got there just as it was really taken off. Yes, yes. Oh, yeah, they had uh, major uh, increases in, like I said, department size and uh, some key retirements that took place. And... He's a very, uh, very intelligent man and uh, did well, you know, through the hiring uh, or promotion process. And, uh, yeah, now at the tender age, I think he's probably around my age, uh, 39 or so, uh, he's captain. Well, wish the best to retired Captain Shilkowski, who fell down and broke his hip. Right. So. Yeah, that, that was an unfortunate accident on his part. Yep. How, I, how, I understand he's doing much better. Yes, he is. They put pins in there and everything, so right. screws in his hip. So yep. I, I guess it'll be okay. Well, I appreciate you checking in. Okay. Okay. All right, talk to you later. All righty. Bye-bye. Channel 3 weather from Brian Allen tonight. Cooler with a low of 56. Looks like I had, shall we? Sure. Tomorrow, sunny with a high of 74. Currently 68 degrees in Cleveland, 68 degrees. Got a good cop story versus a bad cop story. They, they've been getting beat up so much. They've been getting beat up by the mayor. And I'm telling you the truth. If I were a Cleveland cop, I'd really consider walking out. And, and, and I think you could probably quit Cleveland and go to some place like Westlake. Sounds like a lot cushier job. Sounds like a lot less domestic violence and things like that going on. And you'd probably get paid more money. You ever consider that? News Radio, WTAM 1100, Cleveland. But president of the National Association of Criminal Defense Attorneys. Reporters can stroke the flames until there's virtual mob mentality putting tremendous pressure on police. That pressure can lead to mistakes, which in turn leads to a gun-shy mentality among police and prosecutors who have watched colleagues get roasted for blowing a case. Prime example was Richard Jewell of Atlanta, suspect in the Olympic Park bombing, and then he was later cleared. The FBI now suspects the real bomber, abortion clinic bomber suspect Eric Rudolph, escaped to commit similar crimes. Jewell case had a major impact on law enforcement in this country. Well, I have to think the Rodney King incident had a major impact on law enforcement in the, in also, because you never know who's watching and you never know where. We talked about that a couple of weeks ago, talked about being watched in the workplace. Well, if you're a cop, you're being watched in the workplace. If you've got one of those video cameras on your dashboard... Good idea, bad idea? I don't know, not necessarily, a, not necessarily a bad idea. Let's go to Rebecca in Cleveland, you're next. Hi. How are you? Okay. I got a story, believe it or not, from a Cleveland Heights cop. Okay. Um, a friend of mine about four years ago got caught speeding on a residential street in mm -hmm. Cleveland Heights. And the uh, cop pulled him over, and instead of giving him a ticket, he said, you got a choice. You get the ticket, or you do some push-ups and sit-ups here. In the street? Well, I don't know if he made him do it in the middle of the street or not. Well, how old was this guy that when he got pulled over? Oh, uh, probably like in his late teens. Oh, okay. So someone capable of doing push-ups. Yeah. Now, I remember seeing a guy got pulled over in Fairview. They had a problem with people speeding up and down the street, and once somebody complains, then they'll go out and try and do something about it. And they pulled over this guy, and he had to be 70 years old. And he was screaming and yelling. He's doing about 45 and a 25. He's screaming and yelling, do you know how old I am? Do you know how many years I've been driving? And I thought, well, it doesn't matter how many years you've been driving. I think in some instances, I think old people should have to take tests again. Right. M most of the bad drivers, I mean, when I drive around in the middle of the night, I love it. Because I think, okay, well, I've got to take my chances on a drunken driver out there or something like that. But I think I'd rather take my chances than driving around in the middle of the afternoon with a bunch of uh, blue-haired virgins on the road. <laughs> well... I, I, I don't know. Uh, all I know is this friend of mine was sort of lucky because he had a lot of points already. So did he do the push-ups? Yep. Oh, all right. Well, that's a viable alternative, I guess. 
All right, well, I appreciate the story. Sure. All right, bye-bye. Let's go to Dave and Parmer. You're next. Hey, Rick. How are you? How you doing, buddy? Okay. That's good. Hey, you see the car show Friday? Car show Friday. It's, uh, it's on Broadview Road at the general place. Oh, I haven't been out there. Is they, they got a lot of cars? Oh, nice. You, yeah. you got to go. I got my hand, my uh, 69 Chevelle SS 396 there, uh, turbo black. This is a good time. Yeah, I see a lot of nice Chevelles out there lately. Chevelles and Camaros. It seems like they've really been popular to restore. Well, I actually am a Chrysler man. Yeah. And I have a Super B, but it's going to be a year or so before it's ready to go. You know, I find in some regards that a lot of the people at the car shows, they're all really nice people, but a lot of them are older, and they just sit around in lawn chairs, and the women do needlepoint, and the men sit and smoke cigarettes and just BS. Well, I'm your age, Rick, so we, we have a good time. We can go out and hit a joint afterwards. <laughs> well, you know what I... <laughs> You know what? I, I've been going to these car shows and playing the fifty-fifty raffle. And I think I, I think I won oh, almost a hundred bucks in the last couple of weeks. Oh, good for you. Hey, I, we were talking about you know, and I've talked to you off the air and stuff about that. Um, getting some big political figures in the show, you know that. Oh yeah, yeah. So just give me a buzz because I have a real big one for you now. But anyway. Oh, you do. Well, how late are you up? Um, you can just. Give me your one of your producers, and I'll give you my phone number. Oh, I think I've got your phone number. Didn't you uh, leave me a message here at work? Yeah, but i give it to you again. I got uh, Oh, this would be really good for you. But anyway, I, 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 that's off the subject. I, I, mean, you could, I could talk off the air. But I just want to talk to two stories about police. Um, I, I always, you know, been a you know, hot rod guy. I always had these old cars. Right. And two times I was pulled over, and both times the cops were really cool. One time I came out of a McDonald's, I was fighting with my girlfriend. You know, that's kind of commonplace, right? No. Yeah, well. So I, 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 you know, I think, I guess it called breaking the tires or breaking the exhaust or something like that. And I Sp did. Spinning your tires? Uh, yeah, I did. Okay. Yeah, and it was, you know, it was bad enough to get pulled over. And the cop was pretty cool about it. And he, you know, he just gave me a lecture let me go. The second time, I, uh... I just served a ticket, and uh, they didn't let me go because I don't know why. I just they just thought I was a. Uh, uh, Can I ask you a question, Dave? Yes, sir. H have you been drinking tonight? Uh, yeah, I went to a political fundraiser. Yeah. And for the last two hours, I've been drinking coffee and iced tea. Oh, I see. Well, lots of booze flowing there. Well, yeah, we had booze, but that's been two hours ago. I I kind of quit drinking. Uh, I just wanted you sounded a little slurry, just just a little. You know why? Because I'm really tired. Because I got up at six today, and I had uh, I had a march and a parade and stuff like that, and then now I'm just drinking the caffeine to get me going again. Well, there you go. You'll be wide awake and, and tipsy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't. You know, actually, Rick, I I don't drink that much. And, and when you when you do drink, what do you drink, Dave? Uh, I'll drink like a light beer, or I'll drink a vodka tonic or something like that. Yeah, well, we had that, uh, we had that uh, station party for our ratings. Uh, we were down at Mallorca, and I started drinking vodka and cranberry juice at 4 in the afternoon. Yeah, I like those, too. Yeah, a Cape Codder. That's but, what they're called. Yeah. Well, let me continue with the story. I, I continued uh, on in my, my day and, and went uh, to a restaurant with my girlfriend, and the... Uh, I ordered another vodka and cranberry, and the, the bartender thought it would be funny because he knows her to pour her a really strong drink. So they brought me a 18-ounce beer glass with about 16 ounces of vodka in it and just a splash of cranberry. Well, wow. I proceeded to drink that. Then we went to a bar, and I had more vodka and cranberry, and uh, Daniel was there. He said he's never seen me quite like that. And uh, uh, we estimated that I put away two and a half bottles of Stoli. Well, you know... <laughs> Rick, in, in this day and age, and, and maybe I'm, I'm a little bit slurring my words and stuff because I'm a little bit tired, and I haven't drinking earlier. I had a volleyball tournament, too. Well, you've had a busy day, Dave. Yeah, but that's you, you kind of really be careful nowadays. You, you know, I, you know I, I'm in a public eye. You just can't drink that much. I mean, you just have to know your limit, and then once you get to that limit, you know, you go to coffee, you go to iced tea, you go to something like that. Because, you know what, I, I, you know, Rick, I, if I got a DWI, hey, that's my fault. If I kill somebody, you know, I'm going to live with that the rest of my life. So you just have to stop drinking. And I, and I, I you know, I'm not one to be a preacher, but you just have to... Have know to know your limitations. Yeah, yeah, because... All right, Dave. Well, i got to move on. All right. Well, you going to give me a buzz? Yeah, I'll put you on hold, and Tony can get your phone number, and I'll give you a call. All right. See you, Rick. All right. Not tonight, though. 
Okay? No. no. All yeah, right. I'm going to bed in about 10 minutes. Okay. Yeah, hang on. You're on, you're on hold. <sighs> that was pleasant, wasn't it? It's nice to know that he was safe and sound at home. I think for the most part, when people get pulled over, when they get pulled over for drunken driving, I've heard stories from cops that tell me, these people are I'm sloppy drunk, falling down drunk. But I have to question some of the maneuvers that they try and make you go through, like stand on one foot, lean backwards and touch your nose and that kind of thing. I mean, I can get a cop to explain these things. I mean, isn't there anybody that just can't do that? I don't know if I could do that. I mean, depending on what kind of shoes you're wearing or something like that, do they take that into consideration? And if I can get another cop to call, how does that eye thing work? Where they take a pen and run it back and forth? Because I have no idea what they're looking for. We're obviously looking for something. Anyway, stay tuned for Cliff Bakley and coverage of what in the world is happening. 700. Yeah, broadcasting live from downtown Cleveland. Phone number here, 578-1100 in the 216 area code. Talking about cops. And no, nothing bad. I've heard enough bad things about cops from Boss White. I have one line open at 578-1100. I've opened up 578-1111 in the 216 area code. And toll free, 888-723-WTAM. Don't hurt yourselves trying to get through. I want some space, God it. Back. No, God, get away from the gate. I'm telling you, get back now. Before I go to the phones... I've got this really weird story I wanted to play for. Uh, play, uh, where's my Q file? Because uh, this just seems uh, ra rather unusual, so we'll dip into something a little quirky. From Philippi, West Virginia, the city manager in the community says he doesn't know if it's constitutional or not, but shirtless men trying to beat the summer heat will get hit with a $50 fine. The city of Philippi has a nuisance law forbidding toplessness, and men are finding it out the hard way. The goal of the crackdown is to get at shirtless young men with pants around their hips and bandanas on their head. But the show of force against shirtlessness isn't getting everyone's support. A local college official grumbled that the city, of, the city council doesn't seem to have anything better to do. Apparently not. You know, one would think. Now, there's a good example of how a cop would have to go out and enforce a law like that. The city council put down. You have to walk up to some guy because it's really hot out and tell him you're getting a $50 ticket for walking around without your shirt on. Utter nonsense. Let's go to the phones. Uh, Peter in Lakewood, you're next. <laughs> and now let's try Caesar in a car. Hello? Yes. How are you? I'm here. I'm all right. What's on your mind? You got a story about the police? Well, it's just a quick comment, right quick, uh, about okay. the police and the Klan. Sure. Mm -hmm. Go right ahead. You're going to have to turn your radio off, because otherwise you'll hear yourself. Okay, I turn my radio off? Yeah, turn it off, otherwise you'll, you'll be listening to me, and then you're listening to the radio, and, and it, it makes these big pauses go on. Okay. Are you in your car? Yeah, I just got out the car. Ding, 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 ding. What kind, yeah. of, what kind of car is it? It sounds like a GM. It is a GM. Yeah, I knew from the ding, ding. Okay, the Regal. It's a Regal. Oh, all right. A, a fast Regal. Is it? <laughs> uh, how fast? One of them Grand National jobs? Uh, very fast. Okay. Anyway, your story. Oh, we're on the air? Yes. Oh, okay. You snuck that in on me. No. Just a couple of comments right quick. First of all, I'd like to say the Cleveland Police Department does a great job, and I think they're right they're to uh, try to box the uh, Klan rally yeah. on that particular date. But just a little suggestion. Mm -hmm. Maybe Mike White ought to invite the Klan to his house in Cleveland or his wife's house in Lakewood to change. Maybe that would help the situation. Well, I said that maybe the Klan ought to change in his office. That would be a safe spot, wouldn't I, it? I guess it would. I mean, that's, he did that on purpose, you know. He says, oh, well, it was for the safety of the Klan and all that. And I'm thinking, baloney, he did it because he doesn't like the police department. So this is another way to slap him in the face. Hey, I hear you. I, I got to go. That's my comment. Maybe you jump on it. All right. All right. There, there you have it. That's an excellent point. I've brought it up before. Changing in the, into their robes in the police garage is nothing but a, a complete slap in the face to the police department. If you're a Cleveland cop, you can call and be anonymous. Tell me what you really think of Boss White. Because I don't know of all the instances. I mean, all we know is what we read about in the paper. I'm certain there are things that happen that the cops all know about, and we're not privy to that information because, well, I don't know, maybe it was a busy news day and they didn't think it would make the paper. Or maybe it made page 4B and nobody paid any attention to it. The mayor's had a long history of problems with the police department. Hi, you're on the air. Hello, it's your turn. Hi, how you doing, Rick? Good, and you? Good. You said you didn't want your name used, so I didn't say any name. <laughs> I said, I'll, I'll just go to hi, you're on the air. That's probably more prudent. I'm calling you from Menor. Okay. 
I work out here as a police officer. All right. I heard you mention the arm burning incident before. Yeah, they said something that uh, if, if 19 other cops said that they uh, want to take responsibility as well, that it'd be half the department. Well, we pretty much, almost everybody is known about it. This has been going on for 10 or 15 years. But the funny part is that, is the chief's the only one who's saying it's hazing. Uh, because he, a year and a half ago was actually when this investigation took place. And, uh, Could you explain to those who are sitting out there listening, thinking, why would two grown men want to put their arms together and put a cigar or a cigarette in between there to see who gives first? Well, first of all, I'll admit it's not the most intelligent thing that we've ever done, but uh, I'm sure there's plenty of people who've been out drinking and been with friends and, and done uh, similarly unintelligent things. So Yeah, that's, that's it, true. It's, just a, it's a testosterone thing. You know, a couple guys get together with beers and next thing you know. Plus, we all know cops are a little bit different than normal people probably in that we have that streak in us that makes us want to go out and risk ourselves for, you know. Were you involved in this activity? Yes, I was. So does anybody ever say, what happened to your arm? Yeah, oh yeah, sure. And what do you tell them? They tell them exactly what you did? Yeah. Oh, okay. I, I, nobody had any problem with this. It's, it's been going on for, like I said, 10 or 15 years. And matter of fact, there's only, in that time period, 10 or 12 people that ever did it. So it's, it's hardly a required activity. I mean, you know, that. But what's the name of the guy I saw on TV? The, the lieutenant. Okay. Yeah. What's what's his? I forgot his name. His name is Lieutenant Leroy Staten. Okay, Staten. Yeah. Because they didn't put it in the story, but he said he thinks that's because he's involved with the police union, and that's why they're going after him. Well, he's the president of the sergeants and, and lieutenants union. All right. And he's been a thorn in the chief's butt for a long time, and uh, that's that's kind of what I wanted to call you about. I mean, the chief made made an investigation in, internally. And that investigation pretty much cleared everybody. It, it said it was not hazing. It said it was not an initiation into any kind of group. It was just something that a few people did. And it said that uh, the ones who did do it weren't rewarded, and the ones who didn't do it, which outnumbered the ones who did, there was no retribution for, for not doing it. I mean, it was just a matter of fact, the people who did it with that lieutenant sought him out. You know, he didn't, he didn't ask them to do it or, or tell them to do it. So all that happened, and that was this was a year and a half ago. Well, coincidentally, that lieutenant reached the age where he can retire recently here. Okay. And suddenly, the uh, chief decided to put this on him and say, "Why don't you just retire?" You know. You know, uh, I and was. This will all, and this will all go away. I was thinking of an incident that happened in Fairview Park. This was odd. There was a cop that was working off duty uh, as security in a store, mm -hmm. and allegedly, what happened was that he groped someone after he said that they had been a shoplifter, and they complained. Well, there was a video camera in there, and I guess he did grope them. <laughs> and he'd been on 20 years. Yeah. And they gave him the option of either retiring or being prosecuted. And I thought, well, that was pretty nice of them to do, because they didn't have to do that. Well, absolutely. And sometimes that may happen. But I, I, this one is, is if, if you knew, I mean, all the problems we've been having out here, if you remember last year, we, along with the public, waged a war against our own administration, against... Uh, ticket and arrest quotas, if you remember hearing about that at all, that was in the news. Yeah. We ended up winning that. The administration was forced to get rid of those, and there's been bad blood ever since. And, uh, I mean, it's just, you know, the guy is going to retire, and uh, so basically what they did was they named all these patrolmen who either participated or were present at these bars, you know, when this stuff happened, and said, well, if you did it, you were wrong, and if you, and if you were there and you didn't say anything about it, you were wrong. Well, basically, the other 20 guys that you were talking about said, hey, we all knew about this, too. Then, you know, you better put us on that list. If you're going to slam the department, you better, you're going to slam all of us. So. Pronou pronounce the name of your city for me. Mentor. Mentor. Well, it, it's Mentor. Mentor, yeah. Because <laughs> I was going to say, you can always tell when somebody's new in town, when they're on the TV or the radio, when they say Mentor, Ohio. Yeah, right. And I thought, it's not Mentor, it's Mentor. And I got in an argument with somebody about this one night, and they said, no, it's Mentor. And I said, no, it's not, it's Mentor. And I, I looked it up in my dictionary, and it, it says Mentor, a city in, North, in northern Ohio. And it didn't say mentor. A mentor is somebody you look up to. Right. Uh. Well, all I can tell you is stay tuned, because we, there's a lot more going to come out. And we're pretty much just tired of our chief, and uh, that's, <laughs> that's the bottom line. And, and, it, and I'm, obviously, a, a year ago, I would have been afraid to call you and say this. but uh, Oh, it's getting that close. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, I, we're, we're openly, publicly campaigning against this guy now. I mean, our own chief. It's just... It's gotten that bad. Yeah, and so. I, think it's, I think it's even worse in Cleveland, where they don't have any problem with the chief. The problem's with the mayor. And you can openly campaign against the mayor, but I don't know what else you can do to the mayor besides walking out. 
Yeah, we went down to that rally they had, that CPPA had the other day, and supported them because Bob Beck, who's their president, had come out to mentor during the quota battle and supported us. And the Cleveland guys were telling us the same thing. What's this arm-burning thing? This is ridiculous. I mean, the thing you got to keep in mind, this thing happened off-duty. You know, away, you know, we weren't representing ourselves as police officers. We were just guys. So, so it had nothing to do with being cops. So it makes me angry that he's involved in my personal life, you know, that, that the chief has said, I'm going to discipline you for doing this. I mean, it would be like him coming over to your house and saying, you know, I don't like the way you're mowing your back lawn, your backyard. Well, if you uh, get any more information, feel free, you know, when I'm on. Oh, there will be more coming out. Uh, we, we, we have some stuff planned, but uh, I'll, I'll, I'll definitely call you back. I, I, I really appreciate you putting on the show tonight because I've been listening, and I've been talking with some other guys that work here, and they were listening to you too, and it's just nice to hear the... The good versus the bad, because we all know it's it's easy to find the bad. Absolutely, that's all we ever do is hear the bad stories. We yeah. never hear the good ones. So I tell you, you put it really good. When you get enough people in a room, there's always a bad apple. Absolutely. Yeah, there's I, the... I mean, office workers, cops, firemen, you know, city administrators. Anybody's going to be that group, and everyone likes to dwell on the bad cop, you know. But there's, there's a lot more good ones, and and I'm hoping I'm one of them. So. All right. Well, keep in touch. Thanks, Rick. All right. Thanks for calling. Channel 3 weather from Brian Allen tonight, cooler, low of 56. Tomorrow, high of 74, currently 67 degrees in Cleveland. Well, well, more brewing in Mentor. No, it's Mentor. News Radio, WTAM 1100. Ah, let's go back to the phones. Talking about cops. How about some good cop stories for a change instead of all the way over here is bad cop stories? Let's go to, uh, let's go to Joe in Northfield. You're on the air. Hey, Gilly. Yeah, how you doing? been a long time yeah it has been a while i knew you from the west side now you're on the east side how's it treating you i'm still i'm still alive no i guess you are well i'll tell you what living in northfield for the last year i call this police state eight really well there's about a mile and a half stretch of route eight that uh i can look out my apartment window every day these guys would pull their grandmother over on sunday morning well, they've been instructed by somebody that that's the way to generate revenue for the city. And the strange thing about it is they all look like they belong in the WWF. Oh, great big guys with shaved heads? Yes. Well, you know what's interesting? Very scary, my friend. What, you know what's... I thought North Olmsted was bad. You know, well, actually, North Olmsted's not bad. What, what was interesting was that uh, I had been told that they're sending cops now through the Highway Patrol Police Academy. And that a lot of them come out with an attitude like highway patrolmen have, who I guess a lot of people think are robots, because you can't talk your way out of a ticket or nothing else. You get pulled over, and that's that. Well, you remember how we used to go to Debbie D's, no plug intended, but, uh, and we, you know, I mean, come on, you know, you get out of there at 1 o'clock in the morning and, and uh, worry about driving a mile home, but this place is unbelievable. I mean, Nor Northfield Village is unbelievable. I can't believe it. Well, I, I, haven't, I haven't been out there. Well, I mean, I've probably been through it, but I'm not familiar enough with the area. How, how much do they have in the way of tax base out there? Uh, not, not much. So that's why they're pulling people over. They don't even have a fire department. You remember River Edge Township? <laughs> yeah. It was a, all it was was a trailer park uh, on the other end of the Brook Park Bridge heading towards the airport, and they'd sit over there on the side of the road with their car and pull people over. Unbelievable. And so one night, a buddy of mine and I, this is the kind of stupid stuff, we took a refrigerator and painted it to look like a police car, and it was quite heavy, and I knew there was only one cop on duty in those cars, and we drove up there with my pickup truck and dumped it off in their spot where they sat on the side of the road. So we knew that at least they wouldn't be able to sit there for one night. Hey, Gil. Yeah. The other thing I wanted to say was um, I have a Confederate flag, um, the three-by-five foot, hanging in the corner of my living room. Okay. And my mother was from Alabama. I was born in Mobile. I'm very proud of my southern heritage. All right. What I feel offended by is the fact that um, the Klan uses this as a symbol. I know, and then when people see it, they think you're a Klan member or exactly. something. Exactly. I mean, I have friends come over here, black, white, whatever, and you know me, Gilly. Uh, I mean, come on. It's not a racist symbol. No, I always just thought it made people a hillbilly. Well, <laughs> I mean, I'm proud of it, you know? Well, hey, you and know. I'm not a racist. No, I know you're not a racist, I mean, but, uh, well, you're going to have to tell it to the Klan. Oh, well. All right. Good night. All right, good night. Let's go toll-free. You're next. Hello? Hello? You're on the air. Where are you calling from? Hey, Oberlin. Oh, welcome. Hey, I got a good cop story for you. Okay, go right ahead. Hi, Rick. Um, the cop had me dead to rights. North Olmstead cop had an open container in the car. Bad time of my life. And fictitious plates on the car the whole nine, the whole nine yards. And... 
I said, I just looked at him and said, do me a favor and just shoot me and get it over with. He said, nah, that's too much paperwork. <laughs> so I talked to him a little bit, and he said, I'm only going to give you a ticket for not wearing your seatbelt. And he let me go. He followed me all the way home, made sure I got in my driveway. And, man, I never did anything like that again. A buddy of mine got pulled over in North Olmstead, and I'm trying to remember how that worked. He had his kid in the front seat, and his kid wasn't wearing a seatbelt, and he was speeding down Maple Ridge. And the cop said to him, I'll give you two choices. You can either take the ticket for, for speeding, or you can take the ticket for having your kid sitting there with no seatbelt on. And he says, it's much cheaper to take the seatbelt ticket. So he did. And I thought, well, kind of nice of him to give him an option. Otherwise, just write him a ticket and not saying anything. You know, I lived uh, on Cedar Point Road over there by North Olmsted, actually at Brook Park I lived in, but spent most of my life growing up in uh, North Olmsted. And there's some pretty darn good cops over there. Yeah, I've had pretty good experiences. I remember getting pulled over out there. Uh, <clears throat> pardon me. A buddy of mine was driving my car. We got pulled over, and I don't know what it was, fictitious plates or something. And the cop says, just drive it back to the station and park it. And I'm not going to tow it. And then you're going to have to get a ride home. And then when you get a temp tag or plates for it, come back, and I'll look at the registration, and then you can take it away. And I thought, well, he didn't have to do that. Nope. Nope, they don't have to do any of that. They could tow your car away, and that's the end of it. Yeah, you broke the law. Absolutely. So it is up to their discretion a little bit how hard they enforce the law. I mean, obviously, sometimes things just get rolling, and it's, uh, it's beyond their control, even. Those are great cops over there in North Olmsted. All right, well, you plugged them up good. All right, thanks a lot. Hey, you're welcome. Let's go to Lisa in Cleveland. You're next. Hello. Hi. Hi, Rick. How are you? Oh, okay. And you? Pretty good, pretty good. I uh, just wanted to make a comment about the Cleveland police this evening. My husband's a Cleveland police officer. Okay. For 11 years now. And um, i got to say... Um, there's a lot more good cops in Cleveland than, than people realize. I mean, he comes home and he tells me things. Obviously, you know, nobody knows what that job is like unless you've walked in those shoes. But, you know, he'll tell me stories about how he let people go and this and that. And I'm thinking to myself, well, I would have stuck it to him, you know. Yeah. But he's like, well, I'm not out there to really do that, you know, unless you really act a fool or you have it coming or it's something to do with kids, he will stick it to you, you know. But um, I watched an episode of Cops, and I looked down there, and I was like, I know that guy. His name was George. <laughs> I was like, I went to school with him. Yeah. He's a big guy now. Yeah. It was, yeah. The, it was the episode, do you ever watch Cops? Yeah, I do. This was the I one. I have to. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, mem remember the uh, episode with the guy in the bar on 25th, and he had his pants around his ankles? Oh, yeah, I do. And he was yelling, Geronimo! Yeah. Geronimo! That was, George was one of the cops taking him out, and I big thought. Big George, mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, you know him? Mm -hmm. Do you? I do. I've met him a couple times. Well, if you, if you see him, tell him I said hi. I, haven't, maybe, oh, I know when I'll see him. I'll see him at uh, my uh, high school reunion. Sure will. Yeah. But I just also want to say, these guys want to do a, they really do want to do their jobs, but the administration makes it so hard for them that they can't. Yeah, it seems know? like seems like the mayor does not want to get along at all with the cops and goes out of his way to try and stick it to them. I swear to God, he must have had a bad experience as a, as a teenager or something. I mm -hmm. don't know. But, um, and he, it, it has nothing to do with black and white, you know. Um, <laughs> he doesn't get along with, you know, the black shield either, so... Um, I, I think he just had a bad experience, and he has a chip on his shoulder or something. I don't know. Yeah. The ego, I don't know. But Maybe a little bit of everything. I tell you what, my husband's been on 11 years, and he is so fed up, you know. Do, um, do you think there's going to be a blue flu? You know, I, I, I would hope that there would be. Honestly, I do, because I feel like if these guys really don't take a stand, you know, a deliberate stand and do something that's really going to affect, you know, the situation, then it's just going to go on forever. Why, you know, there's no reason why a city this big has had nine police chiefs in since he's, you know, this many years. Five years? Yeah, I mean, that that's ridiculous. They average nine months. Yeah, exactly. Crazy. You know, so. <laughs> I don't know if anything's going to make it better. He'll just be upset, and we'll see what kind of what kind of things he has to say when the police do walk out. That's I, why they need to unite, stick together for once. They really do, and make a stand. Absolutely. You know. Well, uh, appreciate you calling in. Thank you. All right. Bye. And, uh, goodbye. And uh, that's one job I uh, would not want. It's just a little stressful, don't you think? I've seen you watch it on TV. You see these guys 
driving along in the middle of the night and they pull somebody over and you have no idea what's going on. You have no idea who you're pulling over. Good way to end up uh, getting shot at or something. Stay tuned for Cliff Bakley and coverage of what in the world's happening. News Radio, WTAM 1100, Cleveland. Live from WTAM 1100 Cleveland, Rick Gilmore. Is that Gilmore again? The guy's got a lot of intensity. Remember when we heard this? There are black and brown and yellow and white bigots in America, and I would assume that there are black and brown and red and yellow and white bigots in the, the employ of the city of Cleveland. Well, that's a possibility. Couldn't you say that there are black and brown and yellow and white Police officers working in the city of Cleveland that do a damn fine job and are underpaid? Couldn't you come out, Boss White, and say something like that once in a while? Go to a car phone, you're on the air. Hello. Oh, hi, how are you? I'm doing all right. How are you doing tonight? Okay. I had a couple quick comments about Boss White. Sure. I don't think uh, he realizes the kind of devastation he can cause up there. I was a, a city police officer up in northeast Ohio, a small city for about four years. Mm-hmm. And we had a had an administrator that kind of reminds me a lot of Boss White, you know, taking little jabs everywhere he can, but not realizing that, you know, some of the guys are going to get tired of it, and some of the good guys are going to look for employment elsewhere. And you did? Oh, yeah, I'm a, I'm a trooper now. A state trooper? Yeah, I work for the state. Now, what about these rumors that people say, oh, state troopers are all robots, and you, you get pulled over by them, you hey, get... I heard that comment. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was thinking, you know, that's um, what you know, I've heard. We, we do have local police officers that go through our academy now. Okay. Um, there's usually, I don't know, maybe three or four academies a year down there of basic police officers. They go for about half the time as troopers, and, um, they get, they get the best training. I mean, you know, what else can you say? They, the, they go down there, they're, they're up at the crack of dawn, they work hard. Uh, they, you know, because when I went through a, the basic police academy, I went through for a, a little, you know, sheriff's department academy. It was a part-time, just four hours a night. And, you know, these basic police officers that go down to the state patrol academy they're away from their families five days a week just like the troopers are when we go through our academy now at what point did the highway patrol become the state police we're not we're highway patrol okay because there's there's, there's three highway as far as i know there's three highway patrols in the united states left georgia um florida and ohio as far as i know those are the only highway patrols left now, but does the Highway Patrol take on duties of the state police? No, we don't. We, well, we have, our, we have state Highway Patrol police officers, which work on state-owned property, like the, the state building and things of that nature. Oh, okay. But no, we, we don't handle uh, burglaries. We don't handle domestics, unless they happen on the highways or state-owned property. And why is it that the Highway Patrol does not seem to patrol the highways like, within a municipality like Cleveland? Well, because our attitude on that is, they have a police department. They have police officers. We need to be out on county roads, township roads, and interstates where there are no police officers. You know, if we get if we we spend our time within the city, then you've got us, and then you've got the city police officers all in the city. Then nobody's going to be out taking care of the county roads, taking care of the township roads, and things will get out of hand out there. And well, what are you driving? Right now? Yeah. I, I'm in my own car. I'm in a Honda. I mean, what uh, what what's your cruiser? Oh, it's a it's a '99 Crown Vic. And how do they go? I've driven some of the older ones, but I never drove one with a 4.6 in it. It's, it's okay. It's, it's, you know, it's nothing like old, old muscle cars, but uh, you know, they, they, they suit the purpose. How long have you been a cop? I was a police officer in a city for about four and a half years, and I've been with the Highway Patrol for about a year, so I'm a new guy. Okay, I was just curious if you ever got to drive one of them romping, stomping old Plymouths or anything. No, but I heard the comment you made last week. I'm a pretty new listener. And you were commenting about some of the old cars that Cleveland drives? Yeah. I've seen some of those cars. And, and you're right. Cars that we put on the auction block are better than a lot of the cars that those patrolmen are driving. Oh, absolutely. When you guys and, get rid of cars, they're almost new. They're only like 18 months old, aren't they? And exactly. We, we get a car, we get rid of them usually about seventy or 80,000 miles. Cleveland would be better off buying used cars from the Highway Patrol. Yeah. That way they could get rid of some of the old clunkers. They've still got some Fords on the road that are square. That, <laughs> that, that means an 87 or earlier. Right. But I'm, you know, I didn't really want to get into the equipment issue because that's, that's out of my nature. I don't know what everything's going on up there with that. But my comment was that he's going he's gonna to end up losing some good guys. That are, when I was a city police officer, I, I loved my job. I loved it with a passion. And I miss the guys I worked with. I miss working for my city. 
but, you know, you get tired of the crap. When you work for a city police officer, you get to know the people in your beat, you know the people, you know the business owners, you know them all. And the biggest difference between that and being a trooper is I never see the same person twice. You know, you get out, you deal with someone in a crash or in a traffic stop, you give them their ticket, you help them on a crash, you know, you give them a ride, give them gas, and you never see them again. These guys working in the city, they see these people for 25 years at a time. They get to know their people. And Boss White don't want to chase out these good cops who are in there making a difference. Yeah, absolutely. I got one last question for you. Okay. Why do highway patrolmen make you get out of the car and sit in their car while they write you a ticket? Um, every trooper is different. Uh, oh, that's not... Uh, that's, that's not policy, no. Every trooper is different. You do what you're comfortable with. Um, sometimes I do it, sometimes I don't. It all depends on the situation. You know, sometimes if you got a... Um, a whole car full of people and they're being rowdy and this and that. You might just want to bring the, bring the driver out to separate them to keep tension down. You know, it's, it's not policy. Everybody, you do what you're comfortable doing. What would happen if you pulled somebody over, they were all alone, and you said, now I want you to get out and come sit in my car, and they said, I don't want to get out of my car? Well, it just depends. I mean, it, 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 all the situations are different. If it's someone you're suspected of a drunk, or maybe you know, it might be a little old lady or someone that's afraid to get out. So, you know, every, every situation can be different. Well, or I wonder if it's raining. Huh? If it was raining out. Well, that would be kind of rude if you try to have someone get out and come back to your car in the rain. Yeah, unless, so, unless you had a reason for it. So if you're going to get pulled over, do it in the rain. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, thanks for the info. Okay, that's all I wanted to say. Guys in Cleveland, keep, keep your head up. Keep going strong. Uh, administration will change. Keep all right. doing your jobs. Yep, that good point. Administration will change. All right, take care, sir. Y you too. Bye-bye. Yeah, well, that's definitely a highway patrolman, isn't it? Take care, sir. They even call you sir after they give you a ticket. Hi, you're in the air. 600. Hmm, let's go to George in... Who's been waiting the longest? James in Berea, you're next. James? Hello, Rick. How are you? How are you doing? Oh, good. Thanks for the wait. Uh, I recognized your voice. George in North Ridgeville, you're on the air. Six, six. And let's try Anne in Cleveland. Hi, I'm so glad you got that highway patrolman. Why in the world don't they patrol the highways when ODOT is tearing up all the interstates? There's nobody working on them, and it's a parking lot, giving everybody heart attacks, they're late for work. And why don't they say we should work 24 hours a day on these highways? You know, it, it's ridiculous. We're wasting gas, we're wasting human, shall I say, ability, and thanks for having him on. All right, well, wait a minute, Ann, are you there? Yes. Aren't you the one that fell asleep one night? Well, no, I didn't fall asleep. I was called away from the phone on my other phone. Oh, okay. I wouldn't fall asleep on you. Uh, By the way, that yeah. was a terrific job, and your buddy, he can never match you. What are you talking about? The show you were on yesterday afternoon. Oh, oh, you mean the show I did after Mike Trevisano? Yeah, but let's not make his mention his name. Oh, oh I'm was, friends with Mike. He was trying to imitate you. I didn't hear the show. How do you think he was trying to imitate me? Well, uh, that was my impression, because you have your own style, you well, know. Well, I was going to say, are you sure it wasn't me? Because I stopped into the room there for a little bit while he was doing a show. Well, you were talking, too. Yeah, oh, okay. So, you... <laughs> Well, I don't think Mike's trying to imitate me. He certainly was, and I'm a, I'm a good, you know, talk shows are my forte. I can tell the difference. Okay, so who am I trying to imitate? No, he, uh, John, no, you're, you're your own style. All right, well, hey, I, I appreciate that. Hey, and you better go to McCormick and get your tapes and go nationwide. All right, I, I'll, I'll think you about can, it. You know what I'm telling you? Huh? McCormick is the guy who is the manages all the, you know, the bright stars. Well, I don't, I'm not familiar with McCormick. You aren't? He's in the plane dealer every Tuesday. Oh. On the business section. All right, and he'll help me go national. Well, I'm already national. Well, well, no, every day. Oh, all right, I'll think about it. And really, you know, if you've got to make a few bucks, you might as well make a million bucks. There you go. Okay, bye. Bye-bye. I always say that. <sighs> I want to play something real quick. I haven't played in a while. This is a good example in case, uh, in case you're a cop and you're just tuning in and you've never heard me tell this story about uh, me being chased by evil jocks. This is the kind of thing that I used to do when I was a, a younger man, uh, this type of behavior. So, enjoy. There were a group of jacks when I was a teenager, and I remember the night well. I was with my best friend, Jeff. We were driving along in my 64 Buick Wildcat. These jacks were in McDonald's hanging out. One of them was driving Daddy's car, a brand new 1976, a one-year-old 1976 Buick Electra 225. There were seven of them. And we drove through, and they gave us funny looks because we were freaks. We weren't jacks. They gave us dirty looks, and they pulled out, and they were driving next to us. And they got behind us. And they got up next to us again, and I took my cigarette, and I flicked it onto the hood of their car. 
And they got behind us and started chasing us and getting closer. And I said to my buddy Jeff, I said, I want you to do two things. He said, what's that? I said, flip them off and hang on tight. And he said, what? I said, give him the finger. Do it now. And he did. And a chase ensued that if the police knew about this, I would have been in jail for years. We were going down side streets in Fairview Park at 110 miles an hour. I please, I do not condone this type of behavior for anybody. I think it's rather disturbing. Well, it is disturbing. But it's the kind of thing that I'm lucky to be able to be able to sit here and tell you about it. 110 miles an hour down Mastic with a brand new, well, last year's Buick full of jocks on my tail. And I was a damn good driver even when I was 16 or 17. Damn fine. And I had it all timed out as we approached the intersection of 220 and Mastic that that light was going to be just right and that there was a Lincoln Continental getting ready to make a left turn onto 220 and that I'd make it past that Lincoln Continental and that that Buick that was behind me because I was starting to lose him a little because I had a more powerful car with its 425 nail head engine in it and, and not seven people in it. I had it timed out that I knew I'd make it past that Lincoln Continental and they wouldn't. And I flew through that intersection at about 90 miles an hour. At this point, I didn't know what they planned on doing, but I'm certain they weren't real happy with us. They ended up putting that big Buick into a field, and spun it around a couple of times, and I thought we lost them. And they ended up on my tail again. And they ended up chasing me so, so far and so fast that I ended up pulling into the back of the Fairview Police Station because I figured, well, maybe they wouldn't follow me there. And I pulled up the ramp to pull out onto Lorraine Road, and had to stop. There was traffic everywhere. Everywhere. It was around 9 o'clock on a weekend night, and the, the entire street, both directions, had cars. And I couldn't get out. And I had to stop the car. We had the windows up, we had the doors locked. There was only two of us, and we weren't jocks. And they got out of that car, and they had wooden clubs and axe handles and baseball bats. And they started running up towards my car, and I figured, I'm either going to get the hell beat out of me, or my car screwed up, or my windshield broken, or I'm just, I'm just going to look for an opening in traffic, and I'm going to pull right out. And I just floored it and went right out of the traffic, and cars screeched to the brakes on as they tried to avoid me, and I turned my lights off and turned into a gas station that no longer exists, and I remember this to this day. Threw that car in park, and it rolled across the parking lot going, brrrr, as the park ball tries to engage in the transmission. Because I didn't want to hit the brakes, because I didn't want them to see the brake lights. And the car lurched to a stop, and there they went screaming and whooping it up with the windows down and clubs hanging out. They must have known it was me. About that point, I went back to school on Monday, because I had to, and they left me alone. They never bothered me again. But I can understand the hate, because I'll tell you something, if they put that big Buick into a telephone pole at 100 miles an hour, and, and it burst into flames, and I hate to say this, but if it burst into flames and it killed all seven of them, I would not have gone to the police. First off, I would have been scared to death of what would have happened to me. But I can understand the hate because, secondly, I couldn't have cared less because I hated them. I hated them. I, I disliked them that much when I was 16, 17. And I'll bet you I would have thought about it over the years, now and again. But I doubt it would have changed my life. 67 degrees. Talking about cops, trying to tell some good cop stories instead of just bad cop stories all the time. And I had some other stories in front of me I wanted to mention as well, because I thought this was kind of interesting. Looking back on Watergate 25 years after the Nixon resignation, reporter Carl Bernstein said it was just a small piece of the puzzle. It was on this day in 1974 that Richard Nixon announced he'd be resigning the presidency the following day. It was because of the Watergate scandal, uncovered in large part by Bernstein and colleague Bob Woodward of the Washington Post, Bernstein said it turned out that Watergate was just a small part of a truly criminal presidency, he said. He said that's clear from the tapes that have been released since Nixon's death. But at the time, he tells NBC that Nixon ended up behaving admirably by leaving office rather than facing impeachment. Something we cannot say of our uh, current president, huh? He says everyone carried out their proper role, the House, the Supreme Court, and the press, and the system ultimately worked as it should. And, pardon me, let me clear my throat. I guess ultimately the system worked as it should in the case of President Clinton, didn't it? A little off topic there, but uh, they, they, they tried to impeach the guy and it didn't work out. AIDS activists have disrupted Vice President Gore's campaign speech in New Hampshire. Activists were protesting U.S. opposition to a South African AIDS drug policy. They chanted, Gore's greed kills. 
as Gore tried to address some 100 voters. Gore said above the den, let's hear it for free speech. I'd like to talk to you about the risky Republican tax scheme, then offered to meet with the, the activists later. Several activists were escorted out of the building but were not arrested. AIDS activists from ACT UP have been protesting U.S. trade policies towards South Africa at Gore events for months. They say administration policies make it tougher for South Africans to get affordable AIDS drugs. Okay, so much for that. That was the, uh, that was the time when I was talking to a cop and he told me he was friends with a Secret Service agent. And he said that Clinton had gone into a, a speech and had come out and I guess he had been disrupted by AIDS activists that were screaming things. And he was pretty upset. I have two lines open at 578-1100 in the 216 area code. The toll-free 888-723-WTAM. And it was, uh, it was uh, I guess the way it was told is that Clinton came out and he was very upset. Uh, and he got into the limousine and Chelsea was in the back of the limousine. And he proceeded to swear a blue streak. I mean, every word in the book that you can imagine. And I thought, well, uh, not exactly an admirable guy. And I'll tell you for the most part... The story's probably true. You hear stories like that. It came from a Secret Service agent to a cop. To, it's just like when I keep hearing about people that complain about the, uh, the media. And when I, hear, uh, when I hear people say, oh, yeah, the media might have lied. It may have had a slant put on it. That news story may not have been the whole truth. I think for, for the most part of it is that they go out of their way in the pursuit of truth. They go out of their way to try and get the true story. And so most of the things that I think you hear about, about Bill Clinton and that kind of thing, they probably happened. Yeah, not the nicest guy, kind of a miscreant. Well, let's see how many of these calls are good. Chris and his car, you're next. Hey, Gilly, how's it going? Oh, hey, Chris, how are you? Okay, we missed you last week, man. Yeah, yeah, something came up and I, I couldn't make it. You know what, your buddy was there in another dealership car. Really? Yep, Mr. Black Leather Jacket and Greasy Hair. Yeah, that guy that wanted to buy my car, and then uh, he was obviously, and obviously works for a dealer if he was there in a... I wonder if he's driven by, and if, if my car was there, he didn't pull in because he'd be embarrassed. Yeah, they were in a white rib. No, well, the last time it was a, what, a white Caprice. Uh-huh. And did he still have that stupid get-up on? Yep. <laughs> this guy shows up at these car shows, and he, I don't know how old he is, early 20s. Oh, yeah. He's got his hair all greased in a big pompadour and a leather jacket on, and nobody dresses up for those things. No, no. I mean, it looks kind of idiotic, but uh, how was the turnout? Fabulous. I mean, we had wall-to-wall -wall cars. Yeah, something happened that night. I can't remember exactly what it was, but uh, I knew we couldn't make it there. You were missed. But mm. I actually got a good cop story, if you can believe it or not. Okay. Um, coming home from a party out by uh, North Ridgeville, and uh, well, it was probably about, uh, well, it was New Year's Eve, so it was very late, but uh, I pulled out of the driveway, and I have a big half-ton Dodge, and I, I pop my fuse. So, of course, the fuse I pop is goes to all my running lights and my brake lights. Right. So to make the long story short, I'm going up Lorraine Avenue towards Stearns, figure I could hop on 480 and get home, you know, but of course it's it's that night, you know. Here comes a cop up the other way, flashing his lights, flashing his lights, like, you know, so I just thought, well, I, I don't see him. So I quickly turned down Stearns, and you can't go too fast in a, in a half-ton van. It just don't, you know, it's not something that's going to get up and go like your wildcat. So anyway, so uh, I got pulled over by three cop cars. <laughs> and to make the long story short, was I told my blew my fuse, I was tired, I, you know, I played over all this extra time, I wanted to go to bed, I, you know, I had to be to work the next morning. So he asked me if he had a, a, a gum wrapper. I'm like, what the heck would, would this guy be asking me a gum wrapper for? Well, we wrapped the fuse in a dentine gum wrapper, shoved it back into the fuse box, and it worked until I got home. I bought an old New Jersey Highway Patrol car once from a guy named Skyler, and it was, well, pretty clean. It was from, I guess, like I say, in New Jersey, and I guess they don't use salt there or something on the roads. I don't know. It didn't have any rust on it. It had a 440 in it. It went really well. The best. He put quarters in the fuse box. <laughs> he put quarters in there? Yeah, and I, I had the thing, I think, maybe a few hours and some wiring under the hood caught on fire. Oh, great. And I thought, well, yeah, be very careful when stuff is fused like that because the fuse is put in there for a reason. You go putting quarters in there, and they'll turn red hot and just get the wiring going. Well, I pulled it out of the sleeve driveway, and, and, you know, that's when they still had glass fuses in some of the older cars. Right. And uh, I'm like, you know, great, you know, and, and, and the uh, big Dodge vans are right in the glove box. Oh, yeah, okay. You know, so at least it's convenient. You don't have to crawl underneath and or have it hang down because those things always break anyways. And, uh, and, you know, they're not the plug-in type, but like I said, though, he wound up uh, putting a gum wrapper on there, and he's like, put your hairs on until you get out of sight, and then you're on your own. I'm like, great. <laughs> no ticket, nothing. So now what would you do with a plug-in fuse if it went bad? You can't wrap it up in foil, can you? You're screwed. It's plastic. <laughs> yeah, it's plastic with two little inserts, two male ends, one of the female holes. Yeah, and... you're just out of yeah, I guess you would be. All right, well, hey, uh, maybe I'll see you this Thursday. Okay, we're looking for you. All right, how many car shows are you working now? 
Uh, we're doing four car shows a week. So you're making pretty decent money doing this? Or? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll tell you what, uh, we've been a big boy since 94, and we only had one bad year, and I never thought that uh, it would take off as big as it is now. In fact, uh, uh, the American Cruisers has that big show on the 14th coming up, uh, which is uh, this coming Saturday. Yeah. And uh, it's going to be over at Brookgate. I'm not plugging them. I don't belong to their group, but uh, it, it's going to be a f- fabulous car show like Smith and... Uh, it's Brookgate Shopping, so they actually closed the road down, and you can cruise your car in a big circle. The police work, work with them, and it's shoes for kids, so it's all for a good cause. They got all kinds of prizes, and they're probably expecting about three to 400 cars. Now, I wonder if that, uh, have you seen that 64 Chrysler that shows up, or 63 Chrysler that's like Primer? and It's, it's showed up at Big Boy once in a while. Mm-hmm. That guy drove around, you're supposed to do this little cruise around in a circle, and everybody can sit there and watch the cars go by. Hey, he, that's all he did for two hours. <laughs> he just kept going around and around and around and around. And I was like, didn't he get a little bored doing that? Maybe he was trying to dry the primer evenly. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thanks for checking in. Okay. Right, bye bye. Let's go to Adam. You're next. Gilly. Yes. How are you? Good. And you? Why are you always running from the cops? Oh, that's uh, why. Because you've heard that story before. Well, I've heard too many stories. Oh, well, because always we running from the cops. Because I didn't want to get caught. That's why. Well, get you know, it's like. Watching cops, you know, and then people chase, you know. Yeah, I told the story about outrunning the cop down on 480 when he was sleeping on the side of the road before the road was open. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah. what was he doing down there? He was sleeping. Well, but but you're not supposed to run from cops. Well, when you're a kid and you think maybe you can get away, well, maybe you, maybe you try that once in a while. I mean, what if you're on foot and the cops come up and everybody scatters and runs away and whoever can run the fastest, well, they got away. Gilly, you got to quit telling them stories. Well, it's the truth. But, I, but but other people are doing it. No, oh, no, I tell them. I, I say, do not They're do this. They're doing it. Everybody's doing it. Everybody's running from the cops because I tell stories? Sure. Uh, I don't think so. Oh, um, I think so. Okay. They, if you can get away with it, they can. Uh, well, no, I, I say I do not condone this type of behavior. Please do not try this at home and all that, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but you, you tell too many chasing stories. Okay, well, yeah, I'll besides that. tell too many guinea pig stories, too. Yeah, but besides that. Maybe everybody's going out and buying guinea pigs because I'm telling stories. No, no, well, no, they bite. Yeah, well, the one I have now still does bite. Then you shouldn't have a guinea pig. Well, I don't know what I should do with it. I'd take it back to the pet store, but it's been so long now, they probably think I mistreated it. I didn't mistreat it. It just it gets so excited it bites. All right. So I don't know what to do. No, nobody picks it up now because they'll go and pet it, but nobody wants to pick it up because they know it'll turn around and take a chunk out of them. Starts with an E and it ends with an S, right? Maybe. Yeah, something like that. Okay. All right. Talk to you later. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Let's go to Becky in Cleveland Heights. You're next. Yes, well, I have a good cop story. Okay. I was driving early Sunday morning at around 839 mm-hmm. from Euclid to Cleveland Heights. Yes. Going up Noble with two babies in the car. Now, you're going to have to make this a quick story because I've only got about a minute. Okay, and my engine light went on and the car started smoking. I pulled over to an empty gas station, hoping there'd be a payphone there that it would be open and it was closed. And just then, a, a cop car drove right by and I whistled. And the, the lady heard me. She, she, a, lady, a lady cop? Yeah. And you went... She, she, that's exactly like that. No. Yeah. And she turned the car around, came, took me and my two kids to my in-laws. Which well, is very good. I just have one quick question about that. Yeah. Wherever I walk around in Cleveland Heights, I see a lot of cop cars parked. They're off duty, and their cars, which must cost a lot of money, are just tax, our tax dollars at work, are just sitting there. You would think that they go to work and then get their car, not bring their car home with them when they're sleeping. Well, a lot of departments have that policy. I know that, that Elyria is like that. They take their cars home with them. I don't know why. It doesn't, well, doesn't that's just sense. part of the policy. That way, when they leave their house, they're ready to go. I think it's the idea is you get that cop car seen more often, so it's always on the road. So that way when they're driving to and from work, it had, tends to slow people down and that kind of thing. It's just a presence, you know what I mean? Yeah, no, people do feel safer when they're just sitting yep. parked out there. Absolutely. i got to run. Appreciate the call. Yeah, because they, they, even if you take a cop car and put it on the side of the road with a mannequin in it, people are going to slow down. Well, and that guy I outran, that was years ago. I outran that. I mean, it didn't really outrun him. He was sleeping on the side of the road. It was one of those chartreuse green Fords. And I knew we could beat that thing. Those things are dogs. They had 400s in them. They were still slower than molasses in January. Want to email me? It's gillyshow at AOL.com. Now stay tuned for Cliff Bakley and coverage of what in the world is happening.